Good morning, everyone. My name is Reverend Leslie. I'm one of your senior ministers here at New Vision Center. And before I start anything, I want to send out lots and lots of love and appreciation to Reverend Dr. Michelle Whittington for stepping in at the last minute last week <laughs> and delivering an awesome message that brought us right back into the center of our own sense of possibilities. Yes? Oh, we are very lucky here in the Valley of the Sun in the greater Phoenix area where we have a lot, and I mean a lot, of really strong ministers and practitioners of science of mind, of this philosophy that we can draw from when, say, one of your ministers gets a little icky cold and stays in bed for a week. So I so, so appreciate the way everybody pulls together and, um, and, and know that the same thing is going on in other centers all over the Phoenix, where we're sending practitioners back and forth and ministers back and forth to support not just this community, but the recognition that all communities of faith, all communities of soulful gathering are here to support one another in our walks together. Yes? Yeah. yeah. My message this morning is called an elephant or a flea, which is completely self-explanatory, right? I promise it'll make more sense by the time we're complete today. But I want to start. Um, I want to start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. <laughs> which is in January of 2021, where we started our spiritual hero's journey. So, just as a reminder, we've been on this annual year-long spiritual hero's journey for all of 2021, and we started with this idea of each of us has a call to greatness somewhere in our life that is summoning us forward, and we maybe haven't set out upon this journey yet. So we identified our call, and we got all of our needed things together, all the people that could help along the way, all of the practices and skills we were going to need, and then we set off on our adventure into the great unknown, right? And we've had trials and tribulations. We've had grand successes and things we might want to try again a little bit differently next time. And we found ourselves here, where this arrow was pointing, this interesting thing. We've passed the great transformative experience where we've chosen to become something different, something a little bit more than we ever were before. And we have had the revelation of our wisdom that has come to us, and we've finally changed. We finally acknowledged this is who I'm going to be. And we're at this place called atonement, which how very interesting that we find ourselves at the place of atonement in the middle of Jewish high holidays. Ah, oh, it's like we're all one. So atonement, um, the simplest explanation of atonement that I was able to get from one of my dear friends who is a rabbi is atonement is where you make things right. You look at your world and you look at what maybe didn't go the way you thought it ought to have or the way you behaved that might not have been your highest and best, and you make things right. And she pointed out to me that atonement actually breaks down into at one mint. If I know, how shocking, right? <laughs> I'm always so surprised when we're all telling the same story. I'm not surprised. At one mint, if we want to be at one with the truth of our soul, which is indwelling divine, we have to sync it all up, right? We have to sync up all these things that we've learned, all these ways that we've changed, all these things we figured out. We have to integrate them into our being, which sometimes means we have to change our overall outlook. We have to consider a concept that's totally new to make space for integrating what we've learned along the way. So this is going to be one of those nice easy talks. It doesn't challenge you at all. As, as is usual for me, right Linda? <laughs> so as I'm thinking about this, idea of how do we tackle integration and atonement at one mint in our personal hero's journey at this point? What is it that might need to shift in our overall 
concept of the way the world works that will allow all of these little puzzle pieces to click into place a little bit more easily. And I found this really awesome two and a half page essay by our founder, Reverend Dr. Ernest Holmes, in the book Living the Science of Mind. And the, the essay is called, How Does God Know What I'm Doing? And in it, he tells a story of one of his trustees of the Religious Science Institute, which was the original organization he made. In case you didn't know, Ernest Holmes adamantly did not want to start a religion or a church. That, that went well. <laughs> He wanted to start an education center, a philosophy, right? So he had a, a board of trustees, as most large nonprofits do. And he found out after almost a month that one of his trustees had been very, very sick. And he was a little consternated by this because he was just finding out. And he says, probably a little scoldingly because I know the tone I get in me when this happens. Why didn't you call your minister? Why didn't you call the practitioners? Why didn't you get prayer? See, there's a lot of little eye struck faces out in this audience, and I've been on there too because they've, they've had this conversation with me. Why didn't you get a treatment? And he said, oh, I didn't want to bother God or the practitioners with my little problem. Y'all. Y'all. Oh, this is not music to a minister's ears because this is what we do for and with each other, right? Is we take care of each other in consciousness and sometimes with soup. <laughs> but if we don't know, then we can't take care of each other. So I could have given a whole talk on call your bleeping ministers and practitioners bleep 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 but then i i kept reading this because literally that's the first paragraph of this essay and he starts talking about where the fallacy in logic is here beyond the don't call your practitioner fallacy you can't bother a practitioner we live to do this work we don't want you to get sick but we sure love to pray for you when you are but we'll pray for you when you're healthy too so call us for that when you take it a little deeper, though, he said, now see, here's the fallacy, that your problem is little. Is there more life in an elephant than in a flea? Is big and little even a thing in the consciousness of the divine, or is that a made-up human thing? Is there such thing as big or little? Or are they merely the allness of the divine in different forms? Hmm. Hmm. Can you have a little problem? Can you have a big problem? Or are those made up human ideas that mean nothing on the level of prayer and manifestation and healing and wholeness. So here's the invitation for this talk, before we even dig all the way in. If you are listening to me talk and you're going, nope, 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 no, no. Okay, you do not have to take this on. It is obviously completely possible to have a very good, happy life living in the big, little, hard, easy human dichotomy, right? Because the vast majority of the whole world is doing it, and probably we're doing it, and it's completely fine. And there's a deeper way. So if a deeper way, if a bigger way calls to some part of you, try and keep like 5% of your heart open to the idea that there's another way, okay? We're willing to keep the door just cracked, just a little crack? Okay, good, good. Because Ernest Holmes said, he said a lot of things. One of the things he said is, we should eliminate the ideas of big and little or hard and easy because they do not exist 
in the creative mind of the universe. Mm, they do not exist. However, the creative mind of the universe is designed to give us what we ask for. So if I say, oh, I don't need anyone to pray for me for my little illness. I'll just suffer in peace till I get better. What do I get to do? Suffer in peace till I get better. Right? I get to, we get to be right. The universe is very nice to us in that way. We get to be right. And there might be a different way to do it. So let's talk about how we, how we got ourselves into this tangle. The human perspective does, does two things that I think are interesting. From the human perspective, the first thing we do is we, we, we look at the concrete. We look at what we see, right? I see a little stool. I see a bigger lectern. That's, you know, we live in the manifest physical reality. I can knock on them. They're real. It's a thing, right? We love stuff we can touch. Oh, we really love stuff we can touch. We're part of the physical manifest universe, and it makes sense that we like things that are like us. Oh, we do that to God, too, which is super funny, right? When we make God be like us instead of us be like God. <laughs> Just because we like to do it and we're good at it doesn't make it the best plan, but hey, we're, we're good at it. So we see the world, we tend to see the world as sort of this spectrum of qualities, right? Little big, medium-sized. We see easy, hard, worth working at it. Maybe not. <laughs> Definitely not. That's, that's how I look at exercise. The closer it gets to the hard side, the, the less motivated I might be. Um, we see immediate, takes a long time, somewhere on the spectrum. And we tend to focus on trying to get better on the spectrum. So imagine I want to be a swimmer. Come on, it could happen. <laughs> I float. <laughs> Imagine I want to become a swimmer. And, um, and I start out and I'm not great, right? Because I'm a new swimmer. Not great. But I, I, really, I really want to get to that island over there. And as far as the eye can see, it's water. So how am I going to get to that island? I'm going to become a better swimmer, right? I'm going to exercise my arms. I'm going to practice my breathing rhythm. I might watch a YouTube video about it. Hopefully, I get in a pool. <laughs> and I get, I get stronger and faster. And I'm a better swimmer. And it brings me to the island faster. Does that make sense? Is that pretty much what most people would do? If you're super clever, you might get a boat. There's, if there's one to be had. We see it on this spectrum of bad swimmer, decent swimmer, good swimmer, island, right? Okay, well, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with getting good at swimming. There's nothing wrong with working at a skill to get better at it. It's a very reasonable human thing to do. So we're going to put a pin in that and remember that that is a thing that humans do. An unfortunate other thing that humans tend to do is look at where they're at on that spectrum and assume they are much lower on the spectrum than they genuinely are. This is when you hear um, from someone who has been in bed for a week, I'm fine. I don't need prayer for my little problem. I don't want to bother God. I can't breathe, but it's a little problem. They might say things like, um, oh, I want to make a million dollars, but it's going to be really, really hard. They assume for them it's going to be all the way on the challenging side of that spectrum and take a really long time. I think this is where the phrase, um, life's a leap and then you die, comes from. It's going to be really hard and then you're going to die at the end. It's a very human way to look at things, right? What, whatever the option, it's going to be the hardest, slowest, longest, most treacherous path with the least chocolate and the most amount of sit-ups. <laughs> but it's the only way. It's the only way we can get to the island. Oh, oh. So we set ourselves up 
maybe not to have the best experience. I've actually heard from more than 10 people. I, I stopped counting at 10 because it was getting depressing. Um, I'm having a difficult time relating to our annual theme because I am not a hero. The whole premise, we are each a hero on our own journey. We're the, we're the lead character in our story. I'm, I'm not the lead character in my story. If you can't be the lead character in your own story, it's your story. Jeepers, please don't be a side character in your own story. You're telling it. <laughs> and how so normal, so human, so Western culture, right? Minimize the self minimize the self and assume everything's going to be as bad as it could possibly get. Whew. And I'm Gen X and, you know, we've made an art of all that. <laughs> and I know exactly who's Gen X in the room now. <laughs> I got like five really good hearty giggles on that one. So here's the thing with this, with this slider mechanism idea. When I think easy, hard, big, small, everything's on the spectrum. Here's the thing. We think, humans think, water, island, I'm going to swim harder, going to swim faster, going to swim stronger, going to swim better, going to get to the island. And God says, poof, island. <laughs> humans take swimming lessons. God makes a teleporter. <laughs> and when everything in our life is built on this idea of comparatives, of trying to get better on the comparative versus someone else, versus a different experience, versus our own experience, whatever it is, as the solution, we've cheated ourselves out of, poof, teleporter. God does not exist in comparatives. At all. At all. The only reason we see comparatives is because we keep pressing into the law, I want to be a better swimmer. Instead of island. We keep impressing into the law, I want to feel a little bit better. Instead of healed, cured. And when I say we, I'm owning it. I was the one that spent the last 10 days in bed, right? You don't give it up and give a talk that you're not giving to yourself. It's not a thing that's done. So how on earth do we contemplate the idea of letting go of comparatives? It's going to be hard. It's going to take a long time. My things don't matter that much because they're not problems like Janine has. You know, Janine's whole life is falling apart. I just have a hangnail. I couldn't possibly bother God to pray about a hangnail. Dude, hangnails can be very distracting. I had one yesterday. It was unpleasant. As long as we stay caught up in this idea that there are levels of God that we are, have earned the right to enact. Because that's what we're doing, right? We're practicing godding up. We're godding up. We're going to get better at swimming. We're going to be more divine. We're going to be more holy. We're going to be more healthy. We're going to be stronger. We're going to be whatever. Like, God needs our help puffing us up enough that it can fit in there and then act through us. But that was never the way the divine saw any of it. It's only giving us the reflection of what we're asking for, it's certainly not telling us that that's what we should be asking for because the divine is infinite and without preference. Woo. You can't have gradients of anything in an infinite system. The reason there is not more life in an elephant than in a flea is because God can only be or not. God as elephant and God as flea and God as the plant growing on my patio and God as that table. Yeah, it's not even just a livestock. That's all of it. 
God is this cloth right here, and God is this microphone is the same amount of God everywhere because you can't have some of infinite. Infinite is inherently indivisible, unalterable, and doesn't come in gradients. Ooh, is everybody okay? You doing all right out there? Okay. I know this is sort of one of those, but what happened before the Big Bang conversations, you know? <laughs> or how, how big is infinite? It, it doesn't come in pieces. It doesn't come in pieces. And it's without preference. So this whole, I don't want to bother God with my, bother God with my little problem. It can't be little because there's no such thing as big and little. And it can't bother God because God doesn't have a preference. God's just, yes. We heard it in our prayer from Bill. We heard it in the song. God is just, yes. So we can choose to put incremental, small, little, bitty bits in there. And interestingly, we think that means we get a little bit of God. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. There's no little bit of God. We get all of God being our little request. Mm. So we can get all of God being, I just want my nose to stop running so much that I get the little red raw part right here. Ever find yourself making little bargains like that? I, I just want that one, th right? Or we can get world peace. <laughs> Same amount of God. Same non-preference. God is just as happy to heal your little irritated nose issue as world peace. No preference. We're breathing, yes? We're breathing. Ah, oh, Ernest Holmes says, comparatives do not belong to the universe. They are merely differentiations in our own mind. Dropping them completely out of our thought, we contemplate neither the big nor the little, but the thing itself taking form, taking a particular form as you, as me, as movement, as healing, as wholeness, as peace. But we tend to work on the little stuff. Why? We think it's going to be easier. Because we're people and we have this idea of easy and hard. <sighs> but if we want to get to that island, if we need to get, to, if that island is world peace, if that island is cured cancer, if that island is a healed relationship, if that island is mental health. The fastest, strongest way to get there is to stop the human getting better in slow increments and focus on the end goal and let the infinite spirit carry us through any little steps we think we need to get there. Now, spirit doesn't need steps. Isn't that neat? I just, I really look forward to the day when I embody that fully. I really do. Spirit doesn't need steps. I need steps. There's a part of me that still hasn't totally let go of that spectrum, big little thing, right? So I need steps. That's why we say there isn't a process of healing. But there can be a process in healing. Because spirit goes straight there, but sometimes it takes the humans a little while to catch up. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with playing the human game. There's nothing wrong with playing the divine game. Here's a challenge. It's hard to play them both at the same time. It's hard to play them both at the same time. So it's good to continue to focus in on what Ernest had to say a little bit later on in that essay, which is that the very nature of the law is such that it cannot say, I am big in one place and I am little in another. It can only say, I am, and that also I am, including what we call big and little, as it automatically flows through everything, taking the form of all things. If we keep focusing back in on that, it helps us shift a little bit more each day into this idea that the infinitude of God is where I am. And the infinitude of God is wherever I invite it to be through my prayers and my consciousness and my awareness. 
it's there anyway, but it feels really good to, to focus it through us, doesn't it? And invites our consciousness into the process, and the more consciousnesses that are involved in the process, the easier it is for those who are holding out to that human game to loosen their white-knuckled grip on the old way. We can do it our way or the divine way. We can keep focusing on improving the score, because that's what it is, right? Like a video game? I'm going to get a higher score. I'm going to get a higher score. This is how old I am. I am holding an Atari joystick, for those of you too young to know what this is. I started Nintendo, and then I went Atari. I'm confused. <laughs> we can do it that way, or we can change the game entirely. And when we change the game, that's when we find that the invisible hands of the divine are guiding our steps. The next step becomes obvious. Now remember, we don't have to have steps, but most of us are still in the place where we think we do. We can teleport. We can just get there. Um, I was having a great conversation with Rachel the other day, and she pointed out a part where Ernest Holmes talked about when the consciousness is there that we can teleport, poof, we'll just be there. And I genuinely believe that's true. And, in, and most of us aren't quite there yet, though if you are, please send me an email. I need to know about that. For the rest of us, it carries us along the steps. And the invisible hands show us where to step to have the smoothest, quickest trip so we get to that island, whatever the island is for you. That place of at one -ment, of atonement, where the divine in us is so connected to the part of us that we identify that there isn't a separation at all. There isn't one in reality, but we need to be able to perceive reality, the divine reality, to be able to use it, right? So I have a thing that I say, I've said it a couple times in this talk, and I invite you as our invitation for our week. I invite you to, to play with this. And when I say something that has a comparative in it, like that's going to be hard, that's going to take a long time. Oh, I don't know. I'm good at this. I'm better than they are at this, whatever. I stop and I ask myself, is that a made up human thing? Is that a human construct? Is it? And sometimes it just comes down to the question, am I? Are they? Well, you know, he is really good at math. Is he? You know, she's really bad with money. Is she? Am I? Is this even a thing? And more and more, I'm able to pull myself up out of that comparison loop. Not just so that I feel better about myself, which is a lovely side effect. But because the truth is, in God, there are no levels or comparisons at all. God is. I am. And that's the whole story. And so it is. Oh, and so let's take this in a little bit deeper and anchor it into prayer. I invite our practitioners and ministers of religious science to take a stand with me for this prayer. Or anybody who's just really feeling this talk is invited as well. As we lean into the goodness that is right here, right now, the truth that the infinitude of God is in this room, is in the home of every online campus participant, is in every church every philosophical center, every spiritual gathering, every yoga studio, every home study group, every person reading sacred text everywhere in its fullness. Because God cannot be divided, it is everywhere present all the time. And that there's nothing to earn or learn or fix or create that we just need to integrate the truth. That the onus of God is right where we are. And anything we want, need, desire, choose, and press into that law, knowing implicitly the fullness of God is on it. That it is guiding and leading us into the most beautiful, healthy, whole, gorgeous, loving places. And all we need to do is be a yes to that goodness. 
a yes to that goodness. So thankful to know all of that goodness unfolding in the lives of every beloved right here, right now. Thankful, thankful, beyond thankful. And so I release this word into the action of universal law and call it powerful and good as we say together. And so it is.